for coming. This is the last of the every month webinar series that GoGN organizes. We are the Global OER Graduate uh, Network. Um, and as I said, this is December, so this is the last the last webinar of um, 2017. Um, today we have with us Rory McGreal. I think, I mean, I don't really, I can't really organize, um, introduce um, Rory because you probably all know all um, know about him and, and, and his work. But um, anyway, I'm going to do it. In, 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 uh, Rory is the, the UNESCO uh, Commonwealth of Learning Chair holder in, in OER and he's based in, in um, Athabasca, the University of Athabasca University. And um, it was, um, um, GoGN exists, I mean, I, it, it was Fred Mulder in collaboration with with uh, Rory's, uh, the two of them putting their heads together to to actually um, um, start Goji and start the, the network. So we, we we are all very grateful to to him and um, and, and and Fred. Um, and I think that's as much as, as as I'm gonna say for the moment. Um, we we'll let Rory speak and we'll we'll take questions at the end. Um, in the meantime, use the chat if anyone uh, wants to. Um, uh, write anything or has a question or a comment, uh, we'll, we'll pick them up uh, um, during the way, uh, well, I'll try and pick them up during, during, the, during the way and, um, and then we'll put them to Rory towards, towards the end. So uh, that's it. Thanks, Rory. Go ahead. Um, well, good afternoon in Europe. It's morning here and uh, it's just beginning to get the uh, light. We're among the shortest days of the year. Um, I want to start off the presentation uh, with uh, telling you that uh, uh, these uh, slides are all under a Creative Commons attribution license. However, some of the images are fair dealing. And uh, so um, you can certainly use them for educational purposes. Uh, uh, and, of course, the slides themselves uh, you can use for uh, whatever purpose uh, uh, you like. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, point out if uh, um, in the, the part of the uh, presentation that, we're, um, uh, that I'm doing today that I referred to uh, this document, the Open Educational Resources and Collaborative uh, Content Development put out by Enacol. And uh, I would recommend anyone to uh, have a look at that uh, if you are interested in collaborative learning. And uh, um, of course, uh, uh, the main, uh, uh, I believe, the main uh, uh, benefit of uh, open education resource for collaborative learning is that people can uh, get a hold of them. Access uh, is possible and it's access to high quality content, um, to uh, additional le learning resources more than perhaps what you have in your, uh, uh, in your normal course content, and of course the uh, supplemental materials. And so all of these things uh, lead to uh, uh, allow for the possibility of greater collaborations uh, in the learning environment. Um, the other uh, feature, and uh, the one that we uh, we have primarily been focused on in uh, in the United States and Canada, are the savings and the efficiency. And uh, 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 as we know, the marginal cost and effort in making copies and distributing them online is is practically zero. And so you pay zero for it, and uh, you can reproduce them for your. Uh, uh, educational environment at, uh, uh, at, at no cost, really. Um, another feature, again, of supporting collaborative uh, learn is the speed and immediacy with which you can uh, uh, access the resources. Uh, they're immediately available to uh, uh, people uh, in a wide uh, variety of locations um, uh, as needed. So as you can, uh, um, if for example, an issue comes up in a discussion 
in 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 your class, uh, you can immediately turn to a relevant uh, uh, open educational uh, resource and and make use of it. Um, sharing, you can uh, uh, send the different open educational resources to each other and uh, um, uh, back and forth. Uh, use them in many different ways. Um, uh, I, I, I must say here that uh, uh, using our fair dealing rights uh, in uh, in the uh, British uh, uh, common law countries, uh, uh, you can also share much of the uh, uh, much of the uh, commercial content, the non openly licensed content uh, that is available on the internet, as long as you uh, use the uh, uh, the website, and uh, there is no. Uh, uh, copyright restriction on uh, accessing websites. Um, the, the, the benefit of OER that uh, makes them superior to this is that uh, you can actually download them and uh, make them available on your site. And uh, uh, as we know, we can reuse, remix, uh, repurpose them however we like. And uh, we can republish them so we can download them, change them, alter them to uh, uh, a way that fits in with the purpose of our, uh, uh, of our inquiry, and then republish them and put them out there again. And uh, again, uh, for collaborative learning, um, this is a key feature. And of course, uh, in our social networks, there are multiple channels, so we're not restricted uh, to using our uh, information in any one uh, one particular device or in one particular uh, social network. We can jump from social network from one to the other, uh, etc. And uh, uh, Grania Canole has uh, written quite uh, extensively about this, and I would refer you to uh, to, to her works uh, on on this. And of course, uh, we can create uh, multiple versions of the same content. And uh, I'm sure that uh, many, if not most of you, have heard of uh, 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 the whole uh, concept of, of learning styles, which, uh, um, in my opinion, is fatally flawed uh, in that uh, um, the evidence that one person has one learning style um, is very suspect. Um, and uh, however, uh, one person could have one learning style when learning um, mathematics, and another learning style when learning li when uh, studying literature, uh, or they could have one learning style um, in the later years of university, and uh, quite different from the one they had in earlier years of university. In fact, you can have one learning style in the morning, and you could have a different learning style in the evening. However, um, uh, the point, uh, the main point to be learned from the whole learning style discussion, uh, in my opinion, is that it's, uh, it, it, it's a very good pedagogical strategy to have multiple versions of the same concept. That is, uh, have different ways of explaining things. And uh, uh, depending on uh, people's learning style, their mood, uh, their proclivities, their, uh, their uh, level, uh, et cetera, um, uh, there's a better chance of reaching people if you have different versions uh, available for people for learning. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we can also. Uh, uh, depend on the uh, wisdom of crowds uh, concept that uh, if people uh, uh, start using and sharing open educational resources in a major way, um, that new concepts can arise. And uh, um, through the discussion and through the affordances that have been granted by open educational resources for free use, reuse, remixing, etc., uh, we can come to uh, a, a better understanding of concepts uh, uh, within a course or even informally outside of a course. 
And uh, in that way, we can bridge the gap between informal and formal learning. Uh, we can do that by increasing access to all kinds of relevant uh, um, uh, information on the subject that we are uh, addressing. Um, and uh, we can tie in our personal interests uh, and our independent learning and uh, bridge the gap between uh, formal and informal learning. So, open education resources are open and uh, as we know we can augment them, edit them, customize them, aggregate them, uh, reformat them and make mashups and in this way we can uh, begin to think of rather than creating courses of assembling courses, putting courses together based on open educational resources. And this idea is uh, um, similar to the idea of a, a Nikkei uh, furniture that you buy and you assemble it at home. But, uh, there's many different parts to it, so it's, uh, it's not exactly like Lego blocks, which are, are uh, very much one of a kind or, or just three or four different types but uh, a wide variety of uh, uh, information available in open educational resources and we can put it together in many different ways and uh, create our, our courses in that way rather than creating something from scratch. I'm looking at the uh, term below and uh, uh, I think Robert has a good point uh, uh, saying that uh, using the term learning preference yes uh, I, I would uh, prefer that to uh, uh, to get away from the whole controversy about the uh, learning style so uh, um, I'll have to remember to use that uh, uh, more in the future um, you have uh, 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 in, in OER, um, the idea of a, a mediating layer between uh, um, the uh, designer and uh, uh, using different artifacts, which would be OER, and uh, uh, creating, repurposing them, and uh, uh, integrating them into your design. And uh, again, I would uh, refer you to uh, uh, Grania Canole's uh, excellent uh, work on new schemas for uh, mapping pedagogies and technologies. So, um, in constructing OER, um, uh, we can look at reading someone's rich narrative, interpreting it, and understanding it, and making assumptions about it is hard. Whereas, if they've constructed the OER, it immediately has meaning. And this sort of harks back to the old uh, saying that uh, you learn, uh, what is it, 10% of what you hear and 50% uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of what you say and 90% uh, of what you do. Um, I don't think there was ever any concrete evidence of that, but I think that there's an element of truth in that that uh, when students uh, actually construct something, and certainly in many of us, our experience as teachers is that when we teach it, uh, we finally understand it. That uh, sometimes we, we understand something, and uh, when you go to teach it, you realize that uh, uh, you don't understand it as well as you thought. So it refines your, uh, uh, by constructing the OER, by working on it, uh, it refines your knowledge and makes it uh, better. Uh, you become a better uh, teacher because of it. And uh, so we're talking now about learner-generated content. And so uh, as learners generate the content and create the OER, they become uh, like the teacher creating, um, uh, creating a lesson. And uh, this is one of the most powerful ways of learning in any subject. And of course, uh, partnering is an important concept of when you work with others, uh, you learn more uh, because you have two minds attacking uh, the same problem 
And so partnering uh, becomes uh, a very important tool. And again, with open education resources, you're in a much better uh, position to do this. Um, uh, for example, uh, with commercial digital content, um, if you look at the licenses, and I'll be talking a bit more about this later, um, is if you share the content with somebody else, uh, you're breaking the law. And actually, in the United States, th this could be a criminal offense at the moment. So uh, um, OER allow you to make use of the uh, uh, content however you like and partner with whoever you like without worrying about any legal uh, consequences. It allows for mass participation. So again, because uh, uh, OER are accessible and uh, infinitely reproducible, it allows for large numbers of uh, learners to uh, access the content and work together and partner with the other. And uh, certainly OER are a major enabler of, of uh, MOOCs. And uh, um, uh, they are very, uh, uh, very appropriate for mass, uh, mass participation. Also for self-production and publishing, uh, putting it out there. And again, the main, the main benefit of publishing your works as open educational resources, I believe, is that you reach more people. And uh, you can propagate your views and uh, uh, engage in a much wider conversation uh, than you could with any, uh, uh, any kind of commercial content. Another point is the individualization. Um, because we do know that no one size fits all. No textbook, no curriculum fits, uh, is just right for everybody. And because of the affordances of uh, open educational resources, uh, we can look at uh, collaborations with uh, a wide variety of different individuals coming at the uh, learning experience with different perspectives. So um, on this, I'm going to uh, be getting to uh, 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 my main premise here. Is, is this, that for online collaborations, OER are essential. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll be uh, uh, delving a bit deeper into this, that uh, I don't believe it's a, a good thing to do, or it's nice, and it's better than using commercial content. Um, I believe that it's essential if we're going to really collaborate online as teachers and learners. And of course, uh, uh, for archiving, OER uh, can provide a web-based viewable, uh, reusable record of quality educational materials. And we can do this freely uh, without being subject to very restrictive legislation in most countries uh, regarding what you can do with your learning uh, content and how, how you can preserve it. And when we're talking about international collaborations, OER become really essential because you have each country has their own separate copyright laws. And uh, you would need an army of lawyers uh, in order to uh, figure out uh, how you can use uh, your content in all these different countries. Uh, if, if you have copyright restrictions on them. And so, uh, again, another reason uh, for the uh, idea that uh, OER are essential and not just uh, a good thing to do. So, the benefits of OER for collaboration, um, uh, partnerships, again, um, as a review, knowledge sharing, uh, cost savings and efficiency, quality improvements and standards alignment. Uh, again, you can align uh, your OER with whatever curriculum and standards that you have uh, because you're, you can freely change them. Uh, again, it's a support for independent learning, 
and communications and community engagements. Or, well, my, my slide uh, uh, blacked out here, um, uh, but what I, I, I would also propose is that uh, you can have OER uh, that are the full course, that many, um, many professors, if not most, um, do not want to uh, create, uh, assemble, uh, uh, put together all different types of open educational resources. Uh, they want the whole package. And I think this is something that we need to address uh, uh, very strongly in the OER movement, is uh, because uh, uh, many, uh, uh, many argue, professors argue that, hey, I get the full package from uh, Pearson. I get all of the textbook. I've got the online material, the tests, and everything. And that frees me up uh, to do more research and to do other things. And uh, uh, in, with OER, um, of course, many like the idea of OER and uh, uh, like the idea of student-generated content. Uh, they like the idea of mixing and matching and putting the, together these courses. But there are many who just want to have the full package. And again, that too is a, a uh, responsible affordance uh, of open educational resources. And so uh, the key is, uh, again, and I, I find this too often in education, is you have this and or mentality. And uh, people are fighting for their view of uh, whichever way you should do it. And that's the way to do it. And I think that we need to start thinking more in terms of both and and uh, saying that, yeah, you can create your courses. Uh, uh, you can uh, uh, assemble them using all different OER. Or you can take the full package. It's up to you to decide uh, which way you want to go with it. And you can do both. Or you can do hybrids, a bit of uh, a full package, but take out some things and substitute them. There's a wide variety of ways you can approach this as far as uh, uh, when we're talking about uh, uh, collaborations. And again, uh, uh, refer you to this uh, excellent uh, book on, uh, uh, from Inacall on collaboration with OER. And uh, I have the references there for those who want to look after, the, uh, uh, after my talk. Now, having talked about uh, um, the, the, the pedagogical aspects and the uh, course creation aspect. I want to talk now about why uh, we must have uh, OER. And two reasons, uh, digital locks, or as they're referred to, digital rights management and digital licenses. And uh, uh, for DRM, I call it more uh, digital restrictions management rather than digital rights management. With digital rights management, um, the commercial uh, content uh, uh, owners uh, put into your device uh, a uh, software um, that uh, severely restricts what you can do with your device. And uh, depending on the, uh, uh, on the let's say, e-textbook or, or commercial application that you're using, um, they, they make sure that you can't copy and paste or annotate or highlight. Um, you can't text to speech um, using your, your device. Uh, this is a, a, a real problem for visually uh, disabled uh, 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 learners. Uh, you can't change the format. So as if you get a, a, an e-textbook, a commercial book for the Mac, you can't use it on your PC. And never mind that, you can't even move the material 
uh, from one PC to the other. Uh, you can only use it. You're only uh, 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 able to use it on one device. Uh, you can't print anything out. Uh, you can't move your uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, textbook geographically. So as if you go from uh, North America to Europe, uh, it won't work. And uh, this happened to me. Uh, I had a book that I paid for, and uh, I wanted to uh, read it on the plane over to Europe. And uh, I got the message, uh, uh, you're not connected to the internet. Uh, we cannot verify uh, your right to access this uh, product, uh, this uh, e-book. And uh, then when I got to Par Paris in my hotel room, I went to read it that night. I couldn't sleep because of the jet lag. And uh, uh, sorry, this is not available here. You cannot read your book in uh, Europe, yeah, the book that you bought in North America. So it's a very real problem. And if you can imagine, if you're uh, with these types of problems, and you're trying to use commercial products in an international uh, uh, open education course, uh, um, it, it, it becomes so restrictive that you can't use it. And of course, uh, they have the drop dead dates on these uh, e-textbooks, where uh, within a week or two of the final exam, uh, they enter your computer and uh, take out the, uh, uh, the e-book. Uh, and uh, remove it from your computer. And of course, uh, uh, unlike a print textbook, you cannot resell your e-book. E so, uh, so all of these things are prevented uh, by your digital rights management. And uh, um, it creates huge problems. Um, it's, uh, it sort of designs defectiveness into your uh, device. And uh, as you can see uh, uh, from the uh, uh, slide, um, when it's locked by DRM, um, you can't do anything. And uh, it, uh, it's a deliberate, uh, how can I say it? It's, it's a, a, a deliberate crippling of your device and uh, limiting your ability to use your device. Uh, but who's, who's really uh, losing? Um, uh, it, it was said about uh, when they first put on digital locks on the music, uh, they said that any obstacle that makes a record harder to listen to is bad news for the artists that made it. So it's bad news for the artists and uh, seemingly uh, good news for the uh, uh, copyright owners. And uh, um, I just remind you of uh, the Sony rootkit scandal that happened about four or five years ago, where Sony put in the DRM uh, into uh, uh, their uh, collection of uh, music, and it, de it destroyed the operating system on your computer. It was a, a, a huge disaster. And uh, that's what happens with uh, DRM is it enters right into the deep uh, operating system uh, of a computer and has major toxic effects on it. Um, it needs deep permissions into the operating system and it can stop normal operating system functions. So uh, um, it's a, a very serious invasion into your operating system. And uh, by the way, uh, uh, in the United States, they just passed uh, um, a, a law. Um, I don't think it's gone through its final reading yet, but it's gone through the first stage in Congress, um, that uh, all web browsers will have DRM built into it. And uh, this is a new development just uh, last week. And so that everybody using a web browser uh, will be affected by uh, digital rights management. <clears throat> and uh, basically, uh, making your web browser uh, defective. But, and 
this is what the, I believe we should argue, our device is our property. DRM, these digital locks, they restrict our freedom. And here's a simple question. Can we not own and control our own property? Are we going to be living in a world where uh, we don't own and control uh, what we buy? Um, they're putting handcuffs on us and on our devices, uh, but we're innocent. We've done nothing wrong. And, uh, and yet uh, uh, they cripple our devices uh, uh, for no reason. Uh, Cory Doctorow put it this way, uh, there's no theory of capitalism that says that my, my private property should be regulated by the state just because a copyright work is inside of it. And uh, this is in fact what's happening with the um, DRM and the digital licenses. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, this, uh, uh, we get it all the time in Canada. So uh, um, uh, again, uh, a, an example of the restrictiveness of, uh, uh, of them. Now, on top of the digital locks, we also have digital licenses. And uh, in my experience, very few people I know of uh, have actually read the license. When they click on the I agree uh, button on, on an application, uh, very few people actually read what they're agreeing to. But uh, let me just go through a, a few of things that you're agreeing to. Um, number one, you're agreeing that all of the restrictions for DRM are also legal restrictions. So you've agreed that you can't copy, paste, text-to-speech, format change, print it out, move it geographically, etc. You have agreed that that is okay. You've also agreed that the owners have no, no liability, even if the product doesn't work. Well, in common law countries, and again, in many other countries besides common law countries, there's an implicit guarantee that if you buy something, it works. And uh, um, if, if you buy something and it doesn't work, um, the seller has to put in into the contract as is. I sell my ca car as is, which means uh, that they, they are not guaranteeing that it will work. And so, uh, but when you get the, uh, when you sign on the I agree, agree line, you're agreeing that they have, have no liability, that you've given up that right. You've also agreed that the owners can invade your computer without permission and collect and use your personal data. And this does not mean your personal data related to their application. It's any personal data, and you've agreed to this. You also have agreed that you have a privilege to use the product, that you do not own it. And one of the most more onerous uh, uh, restrictions is you're prohibited to show your content to others. So if you, if you have your textbook and you show what you're looking at to another student, um, you've broken the law. This is illegal. And in the United States now, this could be a criminal offense. So uh, uh, you have agreed to that. And you have agreed that you have no rights. And again, in many countries, uh, we have fair dealing or fair use rights. And uh, we've agreed that we don't have them by clicking on the I agree uh, section. And here's an example from, uh, uh, from a, uh, 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 a license where they can come in, announced or unannounced. This is to your home, by the way, you've agreed to, not, not just into your computer. Uh, at their discretion, absolutely. Um, and whether 
it's located on your premises or elsewhere at any time. You've agreed they can come into your home at two in the morning and uh, 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 check your computer in order to see if uh, 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 if you've been misusing it, if you've been using their application in a way that they do not agree to. So, it's becoming this way that vendors can control how, when, where, and with what specific brands of technological assistance audiences are able to access content. Full control over you. And they brought a new concept into the world. You buy but you don't get. Do you remember the world we used to live in? You bought something and you owned it. You bought a hammer and nobody could tell you what kind of nails that you could use with your hammer. Do you remember that world? We don't live in that world anymore. We live in this new world where you buy something and you don't get it. You don't own it. And uh, um, this is becoming a very serious issue, not just for educators, but in many other fields. Um, <clears throat> Audrey Waters put it this way, we all just share and rent on the powerful platforms of Silicon Valley billionaires. This is far from a satisfactory alternative. Uh, Corey Doctor put it this way, that we've returned to feudalism. Uh, in the feudal societies, uh, um, the lords owned everything, and uh, the serfs worked for the lords. Well, today, it's companies. They own everything, and uh, we just uh, work for them. And uh, they own all of our, our, our devices. They control what we do. They maintain the fiction that we own the device, but in fact, uh, uh, they are the real owners. And uh, to show how serious this is, uh, we had a case uh, uh, of a farmer in, uh, in Western Canada uh, with a John Deere tractor, and uh, he bought it for $350,000, and uh, the uh, John Deere uh, uh, cut, it, cut the application. They went into his... Uh, the software on the tractor and uh, uh, made made it immobile, and uh, they told him um, that he'd have to pay uh, five or ten thousand uh, dollars for them to come out in a month uh, to uh, to get it running. Well, if any of you know anything about farming, you know that when the sun's out, you've got to be out there with your tractor. You can't wait a month. You have to be out there and doing things. Um, uh, luckily uh, for this particular farmer, he had a 12-year-old son who knew, uh, knew the Internet reasonably well, and he went out and he found a pirated version of the software, which he installed into his tractor, and he got it going. Uh, but uh, uh, if the company press charges, they don't know who he is because this is all was reported anonymously. Um, but uh, if the if the company finds out who he is, uh, they will pursue him legally, and uh, he he will be uh, arrested and fined considerably for doing this, for just getting his tractor to work. And if you think about it, um, it's not just tractors; it's your car. You own the physical part of the car, but that you do not own the software. They own the software. Um, and your car will not run without that software. And this goes for many other, uh, if not most, devices today, even toasters um, that have a microchip in them with software. You don't own it. They do. They control it. Um, and also, I mean, if you think about it, what about a heart pump where you own the physical heart pump, but they own the software? Um, they can control how that is used. Uh, so uh, electronic voting machines, again, they can be fully controlled by uh, uh, DRM and, uh, uh, and other means, both, uh, both uh, 
uh, with the locks and legally. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, somehow the notion of actually owning the things you buy has become revolutionary. If you bought it, you should own it. It's as simple as that, uh, Kyle Deans tells us. I mean, uh, this was the world we used to live in. You bought it, you own it. And uh, we don't live in that world anymore. So, for us as educators, what should be our reaction? Well, openness, open textbooks. Uh, if it's open, we can copy, paste, text to speech, change the format, print it out, move it anywhere in the world, reuse, remix it, and we retain our privacy and our digital rights. That's why I, I would argue that uh, OER are essential for e-learning implementations, not, uh, not just a nice thing to do, uh, but uh, we must go in that direction. We cannot afford to allow uh, these companies to control uh, how we teach and what we do uh, with our educational applications. David Wiley tells us that uh, openness is the skeleton key that unlocks every attempt at vendor control and lock-in. So with that, I hope we can have some discussion. I'm sure that uh, uh, everyone doesn't agree with me. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, uh, I'm open for questions. Great, and uh, thanks so much, Rory. Um, um, this it has been interesting comments on on the chat. Uh, we could go back to learning styles and learning preferences, as as, as Robert said, or uh, we could go back to the idea of of um, uh, that Vivian mentioned about uh, collaboration. Like, if the teachers are not ready, maybe the students are not ready. Uh, either we could go back to digital rights management, um, digital licenses, and all this. But I'm gonna I'm gonna open it to you guys and see um, if you have any questions for Rory. So if anyone has any question, um, write it on the chat. Yeah, I think it has been, I'm um, just picking up on Vivian's comment, I think it has been one of the most disturbing, if not the most disturbing presentation we've had on GoGN. So... Well, uh, that, ho that holds another can of worms because we have a big movement today in, in uh, the US and Canada. I don't know if it's hit Europe yet, but uh, where you're not allowed to disturb students, that uh, uh, teachers have been uh, uh, reprimanded for uh, bringing in disturbing concepts into the uh, into the uh, discussions in in classes, and uh, uh, for me, um, my view is that if you don't disturb somebody, they're not really uh, uh, they're not really learning. That uh, when you go to university, you should be disturbed. You should have your your understanding of the world challenged, but uh, it's a very dangerous uh, movement now in North America, where um, if if one person in the class is offended, uh, you must uh, uh, well number one you put in a trigger warning that you might be offended, and uh, number two if they are offended you must apologize and uh, and not address that subject again and. Uh, it's uh, it's become a very serious problem in uh, in universities uh, in uh, Canada and the United States. So good, I'm glad you're disturbed. Some of you are disturbed. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, okay, there's a few people writing. I I mean I, I I would like to pick up something, but I'm not sure if these guys are actually going for a question. Okay, in the meantime. Um, so I, I go back to the, the comment that I think that Vivian uh, wrote on the, on the chat in, when, when you were uh, really talking about the collaboration aspect of things and uh, how important collaboration is. And uh, uh, we do speak about collaboration in terms of maybe teachers creating OER, but not so much um, about students uh, 
creating OER, as in it, they need the support. Um, are they really ready or are they not ready? If, if just picking up on, on uh, Vivian's comments, so if the teachers are not necessarily ready, are students ready? Uh, uh, in, in my view, uh, quite often uh, the students are more ready than some of our teachers. So it goes, that goes both ways and uh, uh, students uh, can create uh, OER and uh, uh, perhaps a varying quality. I think uh, uh, David Wiley's done this at the high school level and he's found that uh, um, uh, it's about the one out of 12 or 13 uh, that are reusable uh, in, in an effective way in the classroom that the quality is there. So, uh, but the fact that the quality isn't there doesn't mean it was not a good experience for that student uh, creating the OER. And uh, so it's a way of teaching. Uh, you know, you learn by uh, creating the content yourself. So um, I, think, I think it's a good approach. I do not believe that it's a necessary approach. Um, I believe that there's a, a, a wide range of uh, pedagogies that we can use. And uh, uh, in my experience, uh, most instructors use quite a, a, a range of, uh, uh, they're eclectic, they use quite a range, even though they swear on the Bible that they're constructivist. If you watch them carefully, you will find them uh, uh, using other pedagogies rather than just sticking to constructivism. So uh, um, there's uh, 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 the idea of students creating content, I think, is an excellent idea, but uh, there are other ways to learn as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, again, interesting comments there, like Chris uh, mentioning, too often we focus on the final output, but there's so much more. I mean, this idea of learning through making. Um, is there any other questions coming from you guys in the audience? Because um, I have another one, but I don't want to take over. Um, okay, I will take over then, since nobody's writing. Um, just, I'm, I'm just curious, um, since our audience, so like maybe even people watching the recording later who, who might have an interest in, in, in research and thinking that um, our coach in uh, researchers are very much interested in, in, in doing research about OER and open education. Um, do you think, Rory, there is there's a role for research um, in, in, in terms of addressing of, this, of all these challenges you've, you've been talking about in terms of, um, not only in terms of collaboration, but also in terms of, of this idea of the, uh, the, the challenges we, that we have to face when, when we talk about digital rights management or digital licensing? Oh, I, I think there's a, 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 a large need for uh, good research into not just the, not just the specific uh, uh, topic. I, I mean, I would love to see uh, uh, more graduate students addressing uh, the one the, the the problems that I see, and I do see this as one of the major problems, not just for uh, education, but for society as a whole. Um, uh, we need much more research in, uh, for that, but we also need uh, uh, research for all aspects of open educational resources. There's a, a, a deficit. I mean, we need to create more and more uh, 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 research to, to uh, investigate uh, a wide variety of different uh, aspects. The economics of uh, OER, the uh, uh, the pedagogy of OER, um, the, uh, uh, there's so many different ways of approaching it and addressing OER, uh, and all are needed at this stage. Um, uh, uh, as part of my work with uh, uh, Fred Mulder, um, I, I, I did uh, help him and supported him at the beginning with GoGN, and he helped and supported me creation of the OER Knowledge Cloud. And uh, right now there's about 1,600 research articles and reports available for anyone studying OER. And uh, it's a, a good place to go and find uh, uh, what is available in research, where, where research is taking us. 
and to find your own path as a researcher and uh, pick your own uh, subject area. But I, I would encourage any uh, approach, any different approach to uh, uh, the study of open educational resources. It's, uh, it's sorely needed. I think we, I think we all, we, we all agree. Um, thank you, Rory. I think it's, it's coming up to five. I know we started a few minutes late, but I don't want to, um, I don't want to go beyond five o'clock because that's what we said to people that we were going to do. Um, so unless anyone has a very pressing question, a very important question to ask, if not, we can give you a few seconds. Vivian is, um, no, okay. Um, okay, so I think this this is this is it. Thank you, Rory, very much for for um, sharing your time with us and sharing your wisdom with us. Um, it's it's been disturbing and depressing, but very good at the same time, and uh, very inspiring. I think. Um, um, for everybody, thank you, thank you for coming. Uh, remember that this is the last of the GoGN webinars in, in, like, obviously in 2017. We will not have a webinar on um, the first Wednesday of January because basically we no, nobody will be back yet. But the first uh, uh, webinar in 2018 is is going to be in February, and that is going to be uh, the wonderful. Uh, uh, Caroline Cohn talking about uh, her experience doing research and all that, uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff. <laughs> so again, thank you very much to Rory for, uh, for, for being a wonderful speaker and thank you everybody uh, for, for, for coming and, and sharing your, your time with us and, and your comments. Thank you and um, I don't know, have a good holiday. Bye bye, happy Christmas to everyone and, uh, and a very prosperous new year. And to you. Thanks, Rory. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rory. Bye.